in their lifetime. I want to welcome you here. My name is Pastor Chris Dito from Parkview Assembly of God in Newark, Delaware. I want to welcome you and we've come out tonight to, to cover the topic about wiring and how to get the power of God. How many of you want to know more about the power of God? Amen. Amen. The power of God. Anybody else in construction? Yeah, home improvement projects. Honey do list? Uh, how about a honey do better do list? Right? Amen. So let's pray before we start. Father, we thank you, Lord, that the anointing still breaks the yoke in our lives, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would be in the details of, uh, of, of our lives today, Lord, and let us be obedient in responding to the prompting and the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. As we break open the bread of life this morning, Lord, we just ask that your word would become alive in our hearts, sharper than a double-edged sword, able to divide, Lord, what is of you and what is not of you, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we would respond in proper biblical fashion to your word that's brought forth this morning. We love you. We thank you. We adore you. We honor you. We cherish you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're all under construction. we got about 40 or so minutes to talk about the, the topic today. I, I've got a handout for you, but I want to start, if you have your Bible with you, uh, the e-version, the paper version, whatever version you prefer. You can go to Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, as it's a, a very familiar portion of Scripture on the Holy Spirit. And I have it here in front of me. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV version. The NIV is nearly inspired version. I'm just kidding. It is the new international version. I'm just seeing if you're paying attention this early. How many, how many enjoyed the worship today? Amen. Amen. That was powerful. That's our worship team from Parkview Assembly, or some of them without the ladies. So, hey, men, men, men are anointed to worship. Amen. Amen. We have a good balance between men and women in our worship team, so we're grateful for what God is doing. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. This is Jesus. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they gathered around him and asked, Lord, at this time, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times and the dates the Father has set by his own authority. And here is the, the key verse. But you will receive power when that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. Jesus is telling them, I'm going to leave you, but don't go anywhere. Because I'm going to give you the toolbox you're going to need to establish my church and build my kingdom. This is what today is about, about building God's kingdom within the church. Amen? We are many churches coming together to worship and get together and, and, and pray and allow God to work on us as men of God. And Jesus says it's a promise the Father has for us, for me and for you. And tarry in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. It'd be like saying Dover, Delaware in the United States and the surrounding area. And he says you shall receive power. That Greek word is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite from. He says, I'm going to give you some dynamite. The Christian life should be one of power. And they received power. They were about to receive power to witness to the lost. They were about to receive power to come against the unclean spirits in their culture that they were about to face. And the ability to operate in what was called the gifts of the Spirit or under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. A little bit later on, Peter and John will be standing outside the temple at the gate called Beautiful. And uh, the man was begging and they said, I'm, I don't, you want change? I'm going to give you some change. Silver or gold, I have not. But what I have, I'm going to give to you in the name of Jesus. Get up off your feet and walk. And signs and wonders began to follow them. Now that made them not troublemakers, but history makers. Amen. And so they began to change their culture and be culture cultivators. And we also know that the Holy Spirit that was given in power at that time is our comforter. He's our ever-present help in time of need. He's our teacher. He's the one that has written the Bible. Amen? See, the Holy Spirit would never tell you anything to do that's contrary to the Word of God. Because mm -hmm. He has written the Word of God. 
And so he's in perfect union and unison as a father, son, and Holy Spirit. That is a chapter. <laughs> <laughs> There's power in the word, is what he says. And he is the one that teaches us and leads us and guides us. And Jesus told his disciples to go and wait. Tarry, wait. How many people like to wait online? Shop, right? Anybody? Go shopping with the wife and she says, wait. Right here when I go to the mall. Now. So they were told to wait for the promise. And that promise was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we believe as a Pentecostal church in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's a secondary experience aside from salvation through Jesus Christ. And there's a filling for you. Uh, number one, it says, he enters my life at salvation. That feeling is enters. He enters my life when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence on the inside. It's amazing in, uh, in Christianity that uh, part of the Godhead, the Trinity, would actually dwell on the inside of us. Amazing, right? It says, so he enters my life at salvation, but he erupts, not interrupts, but he erupts like a volcano. E-R-U-P-T-S. He erupts my life when I experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now let me explain a few things to you. In order to be Christ-like, we need the Holy Spirit. That's His presence. When we're in worship together and singing, Lion and our God is a lion, and we're singing, and we sense the presence of God, the presence of God, the next feeling, causes me to be. Be. -E. Causes me to be. To be like who? To be like Jesus, that's the next filling. So the presence of God, when I'm up in the morning and I'm praying, and I'm, sometimes you're reading the word and you just sense the presence of God, he begins to talk to you Amen. on a personal level about what you're going through, and you're like, oh, this devotion is for me this morning, now. <laughs> and all of a sudden you sense God is starting to talk to you and maybe instruct you or warn you, whatever it might be. So the presence of God, the manifest presence of God, the Holy Spirit welling up inside of you causes you to be, to be like you, to be like Jesus. That is one of his characteristics. He takes the word, makes it come alive in your life. It comforts and it convicts. Amen? Amen. But then in order to accomplish things for Jesus, we need his ministry. We need, to, we need to be like Jesus. But in order to accomplish his ministry, we need his power. So here, we need his power. And the power of God, the next feeling, causes me to do. So the presence of God causes me to be, to be like who? And the power of God causes me to do, to do what? To do the ministry of Jesus. See, I don't want to do ministry in the flesh. Amen. Right? Let me tell you something. This is not in my notes, but whatever you birthed in the flesh will have to be maintained by the flesh. Whatever you birthed in the spirit will be maintained by the Holy Spirit. There are good ideas, and then there are God ideas. Amen. I want to have some God ideas to build the kingdom. Amen? Amen? I want to have some God ideas. So the power causes me to do. To do what? To do the ministry of Jesus. That is where the holy baptism of the Holy Spirit comes in. He was in the upper room. He says, guys, I don't think you should leave here just yet. There's some tools I want to put in your toolbox because I want to send you out to complete the job that I have for you to do. I was going to do something at the house a few weeks ago, and I told my wife, I don't have that tool. You know what she said? Go buy it. But it wasn't just going to come to my door. And so I had to go and get the, the, the orbital sander and the little doohickey that held the other doohickey together to fix the other doohickey on the wall that was broke for 16 months. <laughs> so not only is my house under construction, but I'm under construction. In Acts chapter 8, listen to what the Bible says. We see the book of Acts is, is, is just uh, uh, saturated with the power and the presence of God. But when they believed Philip, he proclaimed the good news in Acts 8.12. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. That's water baptized. Pre uh, uh, Philip preaches the word. They accept the word. He says, come on, take me to the river, and I'll water baptize you. So that's what was going on there. Verse 13, Simon showed himself and was baptized. 
He followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria, there was a revival in Samaria, when they heard that Samaria had accepted the word of the Lord, they sent Peter and John to help out in the ministry there. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had been simply baptized in the name of Jesus. Is that in your Bible? Is it? Okay. So Phil preaches the word. They hear the word. They accept Christ. They're water baptized. And they say, John, John, and Paul, you need to go to Samaria and lay hands on them so that they may receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, then Peter and John placed hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When it comes to the endowment of power for life and service, the bestowment of their gifts, and with, with the Holy Spirit comes the endowment of power and life for service and the bestowment of the gifts and their uses. So work out Jesus' ministry in your life. Here's some more feelings. What does it do to me? So now we know who the Holy Spirit is. But what does the baptism of the Holy Spirit do? A, it's an overflowing fullness of the Spirit. An overflowing fullness of the Spirit. John chapter 7, Jesus said, Out of your belly will come rivers of flowing water. Number B, a deepened reverence for God. Acts 2.43, the Bible says they were filled with awe. It was a byproduct. They had a deep reverence for God. You know what? They weren't sinless, but they did sin less. And there was a reverence for God, and there was a quick conviction to sin. As John spoke earlier, when something comes on TV that you're not supposed to be watching, and you know you're not supposed to be watching it, how quick are you to change the channel? And you're know, just entertaining, and then, and then you hear the wife's footsteps coming, and you're like, I'm like, you're expecting me to be no. I shouldn't be watching that. God forbid she can't even be watching that. So this is, a, the whole baptism gives you a, a deep reverence to see an intensified consecration to God and his dedication to his work. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. It, it, it heightens your devotion to Christ. And D, a more active love for Jesus Christ, for his word and for the lost. The main component is for the lost. Amen. Because, you know, these guys were in the upper room. They just crucified Jesus. They were scared for their lives, thinking that they were going to be next. And they needed some sort of power other than themselves to be imparted to them to go out and tell the world, I'm not going outside there. They'll find me next. But when the Holy Spirit came over them and the fire rested upon their heads, they were like, all right, let's go. So live us to Christ and God is here. I'm going to go. I'll lose my life for the sake of gaining it all. The Holy Spirit empowers you to fulfill the purposes of Christ in your life. I'll say it again. The Holy Spirit empowers you to fulfill the purposes of Christ in your life. In John, the 16th chapter, verses 5 through 7, Jesus said, Now I am going to be with him who sent me. None of you will ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. For very, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus is about to be crucified in two days. And he tells them, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And that place is for, is for you. He's going to prepare a place for them. And he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to prepare you for that place. I'll say it again. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Don't worry. I know you're filled with grief. But I'm going to give you the promise, the advocate, the comforter, the paraclete, the Bible says. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to prepare you for that place you are going. Are you getting this? So we're all under construction. Imagine building a wall. Anybody ever put an addition on their house? No one? Everybody ever visit a construction site? <laughs> okay. I watch them, they're putting up walls. They're putting in the baseboard heating, whether it's electric or gas, and plumbing and electricity. 
And I was, uh, I was uh, a floor covering contractor for many years, so I was the last one to come in. They tried to make me come in when they were hanging the lights, and I'm like, mm -mm. I come in last. The electrician, nope. After the electrician, after the drywaller, yep. After the painter, yep. I'm the last guy because I don't want no one ruining the floor. Okay? And so I go into these job sites and I plug my tools into the wall and I'm like, there's no power. And it took us two days to find, find the breaker box. And finally find the breaker box to figure out the breaker box has not been wired to the outside power source. You'll get it in a minute. And so there was no access to the power. Ever feel like if you plateaued in your walk with Jesus Christ and have not yet received that power or that extra push or that anointing of the Holy Spirit, God has more for you today. Amen. In Acts 10, Peter, in Acts 10, 44, Peter was speaking, he's still speaking these words, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. They circumcised believers who had come the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gifts of the Holy Spirit had been poured out to the Gentiles. They were like, wait a second. I thought this was only for the Jewish converts. Now the gifts of the Spirit, Acts chapter 10, the gifts of the Spirit were poured out on the Gentiles and they were astonished. Acts 10, verse 46, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Now here's where it gets tricky. Everybody gets turned off, scared, spooked, whatever you want to call it, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues thing. I know. I, I've been there too. But the initial physical evidence is what we believe. The initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. What is that? It's a heavenly language. And I'll keep it somewhat simple today. It, 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 will, it enhances your prayer life. I was 12 years old. I was in the basement. I was 12 years old. I go up and my mother's side was Catholic, my father's side was Pentecostal, so I was, I was a, a Catholic, Catholic yeah. okay? So I had the best of, of two different uh, denominations in my household, and one day I had a praying grandmother who was filled with the Holy Spirit. I was 12 years old, I would go to church, pray 11, our Father, 16 Hail Marys, and you know, that, that's what I did. But I was 12 years old and I was down in the basement helping my mother with the laundry and the power of the Holy Spirit came over me. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I came up and speaking another language and my mother got on the phone with my grandmother and said, oh my goodness, he's speaking in fucking tongue. <laughs> For those of you who are old enough, you understand what that means. <laughs> and I never knew what it was and what explained to me, but I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then later on, as I was praying the Our Father by my neck, because I get down every night, Our Father wanted to have a home day, blah, blah, blah. And I, no one, I have a conversation with God. And I hear this small voice inside of me praying in a different language unknown to me. And I, I hear it crying in me, and I was like, what is that voice? That's not my voice. What is that? And it intrigued me. So it sort of lay dormant in me for about 14 years until God would come along later in my life and activate it. Now that's my story. This is my story. <laughs> it didn't happen at a Ben Hand conference. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen at a altar call. It didn't happen at a church. It happened in a basement doing the laundry. Mm -hmm. That's my story. What's your story? Jude 120, the little book of Jude, one chapter. Jude 120. Says, but you, dear friends, build yourself up in the most holy faith by praying in the Spirit. So I learned that to partner with the Holy Spirit, and through the evidence, physical evidence of the baptism, it's a speaking in tongues. I'm in my own prayer closet, and 1 Corinthians 14 explains this in my own prayer closet. It's me and the Lord conversing, edifying, building me up, praying in the Spirit. It's not to interrupt the service when the pastor is preaching, by the way. Right? Because Paul said everything must be done decently in order, 1 Corinthians 14, 32. And he gives guidelines in Corinthians because the Corinthian church is just getting a little bit too out of control. Right? And so he had to put some guidelines in for the proper usage of the gifts and structure and order. But back to Acts 1 8. He says, You shall receive power, dunamis, power. Why? Because they were in the upper room and they were scared and 
Jesus had just been crucified and they thought, man, there's going to be a knock on the door and we're going to be next. They were under construction, guys, but they needed power. They needed power. Anybody ever played the Mrs. Pac-Man? Arnold? Do I? Yeah? One of my favorite games. We go down to uh, the shore of the beach, and I'm like, oh man, give me a Pac-Man machine. And I'm playing, I said, honey, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I want a Mrs. Pat. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I got to open my gifts for Christmas. That's what you got. She got me. Wow, 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 wow. That would have made myself clear.
The Lord would say to me, try to take those keys off my hands. That Chris, will you, will you give me a whole lot? I'm like, oh, hold on, Lord, wait, 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 Lord, yeah, just like I'll you go. I thought you can have a little bit, you can have that. It's my life. But Lord, I want everything in return from you. When are you going to take care of me, Lord? When am I going to get the promotion? When am I going to get the job? When am I going to get the correct? When am I going to get the wife? Oh, okay, Lord, I need a little bit more help. And he said, you know, Chris, you need to give me everything. And I'm like, okay, Lord, okay. Okay, Lord. <laughs> Let go. Let go. But we need to surrender it all to the Lord. You know what? Chuck Swindle told me once, hang on very loosely to the things that God gives you. Because it won't have to hurt so hard when he drives them out of your hand. See, everything belongs to the Lord. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. My ministry belongs to the Lord. I'm just a steward of, of the ministry. My marriage belongs to the Lord. My checking account belongs to the Lord. My bills belong to the Lord. You won't get that if you're not a tithe. <laughs> now the word erupts. Let's talk about that for a minute. When you heard that, what, what did you think of when you heard erupts? Volcano. Very powerful eruption. Try to take this soda. <laughs> My wife, my wife wanted me about this. So you're about to take the soda on it and go like this when you pull back. There you go. But if I were to take this and then what happens? What happens? It's the same soda set. What has changed? The activation. Yes. Of the effervescence. <laughs> you can tweet that. <laughs> the activation of what is inside of it. You see, it, it's, it's in here now, but it's not active. But when a little eruption takes place and, and I'm filling, because the bubbles are in there, they're still in there. But when I open that, there's an explosion. And that which is in there needs to come out and get all over everyone. That's an analogy to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The gas, the carbon, is in the bottle. The Holy Spirit is, enters your life at salvation. But there is a capacity, if it is stirred up and activated, for the gas on the inside to erupt once it's released. If I opened the bottle cap, it would have went all over. Four evidences. What time do we got to? Uh, I think we got to 11. We never took 15. Okay, good. How many give me five more minutes? Yeah, okay. 5, 10, 15, 20. 25. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be okay. Four evidences of the eruption of the Holy Spirit on the other side. Four evidences. Four, and I'm not saying you don't do this now, but I'm saying that there'll be an exasperation of it in your life. We, and these are biblical references, gentlemen. The four evidences. Number one is praise. Number one is praise. In Acts 2.11, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. A very common experience to have a reaction is to have pushback. As soon as you hear about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's unusual. We had some uh, kids that came for a live activity over to our church. And because we were a Pentecostal church, they wouldn't get out of the car. You wouldn't get out of the car. They're like, those people going to speak in tongues? <laughs> I'm like, we're not. Is this what the Presbyterians say? There's something wrong, folks. When I can get the word of God and say, hey, let me show you what the Bible says. Now, my text says that that stopped after the first century. Oh, when, when, did, when did Jesus say that? Amen. Amen. I didn't see what Jesus said this side or that side. I, 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 I bet you if his wife was suffering from cancer and you want to answer an altar call and Jesus was going to heal her and raise her up and eradicate that cancer, I believe in this. I believe in the gifts real quick. But that's what we need, a demonstration of the gifts. Gentlemen. We need a demonstration. So we see in the Bible that they're filled with praise. 
and praise was a byproduct of the eruption or the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and four, these are the four things that happened when the Holy Spirit interrupted their lives. The first thing was praise. They started to praise God in chapter 2. The people who were gathered with them heard them declaring the wonders of God. So here's what I've learned. The Holy Spirit is on earth to be able to point people to Jesus. That's his primary mission. But he also to empower us as believers to point people to Jesus, to receive the power and the ministry of Jesus. And the, and the byproduct of that is going to be an overflowing of praise in our life. Anytime Jesus is exalted, the Holy Spirit gets excited. He's like, yeah, that's right, hallelujah. He's, he's yeah. preaching in the background. I can hear him. As we start to worship, as we did earlier, we start to align ourselves with the Holy Spirit's mission, with Jesus' vision for our life. And he starts to get active inside of us. The bubbles, the bubbles start to get stirred up on the inside of us, start to get active. And, and that's when the eruption starts. And we can see men raise their hand, and maybe they're quiet, or maybe they're, they're praising the Lord. And maybe you're, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you're singing a spiritual song to the Lord. You might notice as we begin to worship in an environment like this, you might say, something is happening to me. I feel motivated. I feel inspired to be closer to God. Something happens when the atmosphere is conducive to praise and worship. Amen? Amen. It's a wonderful thing because the Spirit of God responds inside of me and you during praise. Well, Pastor, is the anointing prayed down or is it worked up? Well, a little bit of each. A little bit of each. We need to activate the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And then the presence of God begins to flow in a corporate setting. Amen? Amen. Jesus, I love saying in the Revelation song, Jesus, your name is power. Yeah. You see, everybody starts to get up on their toes when, when the anointing starts to come into service. They start to praise him. And his name is lifted higher. I start to feel closer to God. I'm telling you that praise activates your spirit. The baptism of the spirit will take your praise and worship to a whole nother level. The Holy Spirit starts to come in and activate those bubbles inside of you and get you all stored up. The second, the second evidence of the eruption, the Bible says, is prophecy. Prophecy. When Paul placed his hands on them, Acts 19.6, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, Acts 19, 6, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. I'm not making this up, it's in your Bible. Second thing that happens when the Holy Spirit comes in and you receive the baptism, we start to prophesy. Now let me explain prophecy or prophesying. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament historically, it was always about predicting what God was going to do. This is going to happen in the future, and we understand that, because the prophecy was given to reveal Jesus Christ and, and what he is doing and what he's going to do. But in, and now, as New Testament believers, prophesying is not particularly predicting things, but speaking wisdom into people's lives. You know, the Bible says there are words of knowledge and words of wisdom. And when we pray for one another, and we're just in a setting like a manner at the altar, and we're laying hands on men and say, you know, I just feel like you know, the Lord has helped help me to encourage you. Uh, you, know, you may be out of work, and you're looking for a job, and then they'll look at you like, how do you know? Like you're reading my mail. And I know you may be struggling in your marriage, and that's like, how does he know that? It's by revelation of the Holy Spirit. It's all of things, you know? Yeah, no, you're, the Lord's just saying, step out in faith. And you're like, man, put in that resume. Oh, little things, little things, little deposits by the Holy Spirit prompting you, hey, don't be scared of Scripture. Fear not. First Corinthians 14 describes it as when we prophesy, we do it for people's encouragement, for strengthening and to comfort them. And speaking, encouragement is what it is. It's different than someone... Uh, just coming up with a thought in your head and saying something nice to somebody. These are Holy Spirit inspired words of encouragement. You may have had that happen to you where someone came up to you and you received a, a sort of a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom from the Lord when you were at a certain place in your life and you were, you were saying, oh Lord, speak to me. And then someone comes up and speaks what we would call 
A. You're told on the 15th. Told on the 15th. Prophetic word. You say, where in the world did that come from? The thought wasn't even in your head. Because it wasn't your thought, it was prompted by the Holy Spirit in that other person. Prophecy is a Holy Spirit-inspired encouragement. I don't know about you, but I think we need some Holy Spirit-inspired encouragement. Amen? Amen? Our homes need to be Holy Spirit-inspired. Our marriages need to be Holy Spirit-inspired. We need to live a Holy Spirit-inspired life. It's so much better when you're living in an environment where people are speaking life instead of complaining. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we don't even want to go to work sometimes because it's such a bad atmosphere. Anyone ever been there? But in an atmosphere where people are speaking life and words of encouragement, uh, 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 we all need an atmosphere that's conducive to encouragement. I didn't say pathetic, I said prophetic. And that's not doom and gloom. I, I read the end of the book and we win. I, I read the end of the book and we win. The third one is a prayer language. The first one is praise. The second one is prophecy. The third one is a prayer language. In Acts 10, 46, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. There's the third one. It's one of the most misunderstood of the Bible. They begin to pray in a prayer language or spoke in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to do so. All right. This one may need a little bit of an explanation for you because it's the one that it typically is the most unusual. We do see this in the scriptures, but what does it mean to speak in tongues? It's to pray out in a prayer language that you've never studied or never learned, and it's just you and God, and through the Holy Spirit, He comes and, and activates that gift in you, and you're praying in the Spirit. There's something supernatural happening, and then you learn to practice partnering with the Holy Spirit in prayer. Later on, when I got my life straightened out, when I was about 30 years old, I got down one night to pray, and there was that voice again inside of me in that prayer language. And I'm like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I saw that somewhere. I saw that. And then I began to watch some Christian TV. And I began to say, that's what that was? When I was 12, I don't know what they me. I didn't know. But the Holy Spirit didn't leave me or forsake me, even in my sin. Because I was down the shore at the club with Snooky. <laughs> <laughs> and I was living my life on the wrong side of the tracks, bro. But I still had the Holy Spirit inside of me. He was the pot, he was, he was, he was grieved. Let me tell you, he was grieved by the way I was living. But after. God had straightened me out, put me back on the right course. I was just alone with God one night, and I heard the Holy Spirit begin to pray through me in my prayer language. And then I found some good mentors and counselors in my life, and I began to look, and I, I began to pray along with the Holy Spirit in that prayer language and building my faith up. And God said, okay, I'm calling you to ministry. I said, no, no, I'm not even talking to the guy in the back of me. <laughs> not talking, I'm not. I'm not. I didn't have gone to Bible college, so I was like, but you're going to. And I'm like, no, no, you, you mean the guy behind me. I'm good, Lord. I am good. And the Lord said, you're going to be even better if you surrender to me. And I began to realize this prayer language was an endowment, an empowerment from on high. And I realized what happened to me when I was 12 years old. Praying in the Spirit or praying in our spiritual language allows the Holy Spirit to pray things through you that you can never come up with on your own. Because there's things that I don't know about you and you don't know about me, but the Holy Spirit is better at praying than you and me. Amen. And He'll reveal things to you. I'll be in the morning in my devotional time and I'll feel the Holy Spirit come upon me and I'll just partner with Him quietly. I won't, you know, so my life doesn't come down in the morning and I'm floating in the living room speaking with the tongues with oatmeal on my face. It's, it's not what it's about. Right? I'm not disrupting the house. It's, it's, it's between me and the Lord and I can be in my own little prayer closet, Jesus said, in your own prayer closet. We don't go out to the highways and byways. I'm in my prayer closet. I'm edifying. Ed 1 Corinthians 14 says it's for edification. So me and the Lord are getting built up together. He's depositing things in me. I don't even know what they are. So when I go out and during the day and I go to go through the yellow light, I feel the Holy Spirit say, stop. And I stop. And the train goes by. 
There's a partnership going on, knowing things that are taking care of me. It's a prayer language. Number four. Number four, power, power, power. Dunamis, power, might. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This involves the stirring of the Holy Spirit up for the activation of the gifts that we can witness to people. This is what we need in America, my brother. We need to get out and to be witnesses. The power. You say, well, I don't know what they're going to think of me if I invite them to church and this Jesus thing. It's like, now, let me, let, me, let me tell you what you need, brother. I love you enough to tell you that you need Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. But without him, you know, you're not going to be fulfilled. You've tried everything. You've tried Oprah. You've tried Dr. Phil. You've tried Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that will give you the boldness. And they may not. It may just be scattering seeds, scattering seeds, scattering seeds, scattering seeds. Well, let me bring you to a place as I close today. There's a story in the Bible about a prophet, a young prophet, Elisha, following an old-time prophet, Elijah. And so they have this encounter. Elijah is going home to be with the Lord. And so Elijah wants the anointing. He says, I, I, I want the double portion. He says, who do you ask for a hard thing? He says, why is it hard? He says, well, if you see me when I go, you'll get it. If you don't see me when I go, you won't. And he says, why don't you wait here? I'm going to Gilgal. And the prophet Elisha makes his way to Gilgal. Everybody say Gilgal. Gilgal. And so Elisha has a choice to follow him to Gilgal or to stay there and just hang out. And he decides, he goes, Tyrant, right? he, I'm, I'm going to follow him to Gilgal. And then his, the, the son of the prophets in the school of prophets said, you know, your master's going to be taken from you today. And he tells him, see, I'm a Silence. Keep your mouth shut. And he follows him to Gilgal. Gilgal is the first spot in your walk with Jesus. Gilgal in Hebrew means the rolling away of the flesh. This is where you're born again in your spiritual Gilgal. You come to Gilgal, it was Israel's first place of encampment. It was the place where they built up the military. It's the place where they celebrated Passover. This is the place where you meet Jesus and have communion with Jesus. And so Elijah says to his protege, he goes, you can, you can wait here in Gilgal. But I'm going to Bethel. You want to follow me, you can. But I'm going to Bethel. And he says, Terry, I pray thee, I'm going to follow you to Bethel. So this is the second stop in your walk with the Lord. Bethel means house of God. This is where you go from Gilgal, from being just born again, into Bethel, into the house of God. Where God is beginning to use you in his church. Bethel, house of God. El is God, Beth is house. And so it has to do with a man named Jacob who went to Bethel and built an altar there. See, Bethel is where you're going to learn how to build your altar in your house. Amen. 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 You learn to build your altar in your house. You're going to be how great be a man of the word. You're going to be a man of prayer. And all of a sudden, uh, Jacob went to Bethel and he saw the face of God at a place called Peniel. Bethel, house of God, Peniel, face of God. The Bible says he wrestles with an angel. The angel dislocates his hip, sort of like I have right now, a hip flexor. Mm -hmm. and, and he dislocates his hip, and, he, and, and Jacob walks away with a limp, but he changes his name from Jacob to Israel, prince of God. Let me take you through. What happens in the house of God when you start to grow in Christ? You go from Gilgal, Amen. just being born again, Amen. to working in the church, finding who you are in Christ, activating those ministerial gifts, whether it's instrumental, whether it's in the men's ministry, outreach, prayer, whatever it might be, a greeter, an usher, a baker, a butcher, a candlestick maker, whatever <laughs> it might be, in the body of Christ, you go from uh, Gilgal to Bethel to see Peniel, the face of God, to be turned into Israel, the Prince of God. And during the process, you might even get wounded. Jacob is like, well, what are you doing to me? So God says to him, we good? We still friends? Sorry about the whole hip thing. <laughs> but I just have to make sure you're on my team. Take it the wrong way. I still love you. But I had to wrestle the flesh off you. Amen. Walked away with a limp. But you knew who God was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still friends. Still friends? Mm -hmm. 
although he slay me. <laughs> I'm still here. So you go from Gilgal to Bethel, and he says, Harry, I pray thee, I'm going to take off, I'm going to Jericho. He says, uh, I'm going to follow you. Jer Jericho is the place in Joshua 6 where God begins to you know, identify to pull down strongholds. That's the next session we need to go to. <laughs> Pulling down strongholds. See, you can be saved and born again in a mess. You could grow old in Christ and never grow up in Christ. That'll preach. One service. And you won't be invited back either. <laughs> so you go, you go to Gilgal where you get born again. Bethel, you start working in the house of God. And then God says, come on, let's take you to Jericho to identify and pull down your strongholds. And once you pull down your strongholds, then God is going to use you and put your pain inside of a toolbox to use your pain to help other men pull down their strongholds. Amen. God. And so now, I, but the problem is, too many men carry around the baggage of pain. Uh-huh. And the pain. Now I'm divorced, pastor. Oh, snap out of it. Maybe God wants to use that divorce to help the next guy that's going to do a divorce. I just have bankruptcy, pastor. That's okay. That's okay. You just start taking care of your life financially. The Lord's going to take care of you. Now for the other guy that's going through bankruptcy, you need to speak it to him. God will use your pain to enhance his ministry. And so he says, as we we got five minutes left, as he closes, he says, Terry, I pray thee, I'm going over the Jordan River for the double portion. Now the double portion is the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So he goes from Gilgal to get born again to Bethel to the house of God where God starts using him. He's building an altar all the way to Jericho where he pulls down his strongholds and identifies the other person's strongholds and begins to pull them down. But the, turn to your neighbor and say, there's more for you than where you're at. So he says, stay here. i got to cross the Jordan River. He says, no, I'm going to follow you. See, it's to the degree that you want to follow Jesus. You have as much Jesus as you want. Amen. You have as much Jesus. You want as much Jesus. That's how much you get. But if you want more, you, Elijah is a is a prototype of you and me. Elisha is Jesus, and we got to follow Jesus. And he says, "Come on with me, son." And he says, "Well, well how are we going to cross the Jordan River?" He takes off his mantle. The Bible says, and he goes like this, and boom, the Jordan River parts. Amen. Like that. He's like, the double portion's on the other side. So they cross over to the other side, and as soon as they get to the other side, they don't even stop at Wawa. <laughs> they don't even stop. And the Bible says a chariot comes out of the sky and takes the prophet Elijah. And just like, man, my, my protege is gone. And he's standing there, and all of a sudden, out of the sky, there's the double portion. Amen. There's a double portion. It was his jacket that dropped. The anointing was on the jacket. And see, it ain't my jacket. It's your jacket. It's your jacket. It's your jacket. It's your jacket. It's your, I can't pick it up for you, bro. It's not my anointing. It's your anointing. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, pick it up for yourself. So I can't pick up your anointing. Because it's your anointing, and the minute yeah. he picks it up, the power of God comes on him, Woo. and he goes to do Hanabashay. He goes to do 14 miracles, twice as many as Elijah. Amen. And he goes back and he says, I gotta get back to, 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 to the other side. Anointing. <laughs> Use it. I'm gonna look stupid, but he doesn't say. He says, where is the God of Elijah? Boom! Man. He said, it worked for him. Let's see. And all of a sudden, boom! The Jordan River falls. And he says, all right, man, he deals me. I'm going to the other side. I'm going <coughs> down now. You can put that on, man. So let's stand to our feet. The, the other side is the double portion. The other side is the power of God. The other side is where the anointing is.
the other side and said, wait, power. If you need the power today, if you need the power today, if you need the power today to develop a portion today, I want you to come up. I want you to come up. I want to pray for you. I want to activate that gift in you. I want the anointing to flow in your life. I don't want you to stay stuck in Gilgal. I don't want you to stay stuck in Bethel. I don't want you to stay stuck in Jericho. I want you to cross the Jordan River and get the double portion of the anointing of the Holy Ghost and feel the power of God being activated in your life. Brother, you're ready. Come on. Jeremiah, come. Uh, Rod, you're going to come and help me come. Whichever one who needs the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I want you to come today.